Hello there and welcome to The Meaningful Stitch. This is episode 26 and I am Amy Palco and I'm coming to you from Edinburgh, Scotland. And this is my digital home from home, a place where I get to share with you my knitting practice and my knitting projects. I have quite a lot of knitting to share with you today, lots of different projects, uh, one finished item, a few works in progress and some mending also. But before I get to all of that, um, I would like to share with you a card that I drew from the deck, the Wild Quan Yin, which is a beautiful deck by Alana Fairchild. Uh, she has lots of beautiful decks, so if you are unfamiliar with oracle cards and you're looking for a starting place, you could do worse with, it, with checking out Alana Fairchild. So I was thinking this morning, well, what I should say first is that between the time that I posted last and today, war has broken out in Ukraine. And if you're anything like me, you've probably been watching lots of news, uh, watching lots of um, very difficult uh, testimony coming out uh, from Ukraine. And, uh, and it's all been very deeply upsetting. And then sitting with a sense of one's own personal powerlessness you know, I think there's absolutely things that we can do. We can offer support and resources uh, to, to various different uh, channels that are providing those levels of support. Um, but other than that, I think we can apply pressure to our governments to provide aid and support. But um, other than that, like I said, you, you end up feeling a bit powerless. So I was thinking all of that this morning when I was watching the news and then I decided that today I was going to do my podcast and so I had to choose a card for us. So looking at my various different decks, I decided on the wild Quan Yin because Quan Yin is a goddess of compassion and kindness. Uh, not kind of like an airy fairy idea of, of compassion or kindness, but, but very fierce and very strong kindness. Um, and so that felt like an appropriate deck to choose from. And I was absolutely flabbergasted when I shuffled the deck, cut the cards and drew this one here. And the card is called Blue Mother Yellow Mountain Gibbous Moon. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been seeing these blue and yellow uh, colours together in lots of places offering support to, to Ukraine. So I thought that was particularly apt uh, the guide that accompanies this deck is very extensive, as you can see. So I'm not going to read you all the words for this particular card, but I will read you a little bit. This oracle brings you special and immediate healing if you have lost faith in people, you've been drawn into questioning or doubt about whether humanity can make it, you've been concerned about the state of the environment, you've been profoundly disappointed by a person or event in your life not turning out the way you had hoped. You were exhausted, depressed, confused, overwhelmed, or fatigued in body, heart, or mind. The goodness of the divine brotherhood and sisterhood, of loving and evolved human souls, who have nothing but affection and goodwill towards you and all of humanity, reverberates throughout our prayers from the sacred Yellow Mountain. Those prayers can be felt as vibrations in your bones should you take a moment to stop and feel them. Your soul can hear them. Will you turn your attention to your inner hearing for a moment? You will hear the, you will feel or hear the prayers. You will receive them whether you hear them clearly or not, but to even sense the vibration of the prayers can be a truly special life-changing moment. Let the prayers of the loving ones your own loving prayers for your spiritual growth and the spiritual growth of others become your healing, your medicine, your therapy. They have great power and effect genuine healing in the world. Even the most desolate and despairing heart, the bleakest mind shrouded in darkness and the most fatigued body can be blessed, restored and repaired by the power of this goodwill, these prayers. If it has been lost, your hope shall return to you your faith, no matter how shattered by experience, loss or fear, shall return to you empowered and whole. Your trust and your enthusiasm, your happiness and your peace shall be returned to you. Every prayer you make for the greater good of humanity, 
from a quiet place of simple affection and hope for the spiritual liberation of others plugs you into that energetic network of goodwill and gives you the ability to help others and be helped too. So that's my prayer for all of you. And I think actually in my knitting practice, I often think about prayer um, in a in a kind of a secular way, I suppose. Um, my, my prayers are for kindness or for compassion or for connection, for belonging, for love. And I think about all of these these words and these themes and these feelings as I complete each stitch on my in, in the rows of my knitting. And so in so doing, I believe that I'm sending out all of that love and kindness and belonging out into the world so that I can receive it and so that we can all receive it. And, uh, and that may bring us a sense of, a bit of sense of peace, I suppose, and, um, and alongside, you know, taking very tangible actions and activism, um, it can really help to restore us and allow our, ourselves to feel like we're moving forward from a place of wholeness and security and stability, so, and nourishment. Okay, my darlings, on to the knitting. I have a finished, well, actually, I'll start with what I'm wearing. <laughs> I am wearing Lily's bubble sweater. Now, I love this jumper. I knitted it, gosh, was it last year, year before? It's knitted in drops. I think it's in Nepal. Yes, it's drops Nepal in the dark rose colour. And I've held it with, you can see, got a fabulous halo, the dark rose uh, drops mohair silk. And it's a super cozy jumper. I will move my tea and then I'll stand up so you can see it. So you can see it's got again a little bit of bobbles. <laughs> I didn't de-bobble it before, but it's fantastic. And the bobbles kind of, it's quite a, a deep yoke and it's got these fabulous bobbles which start off small and then move to larger bobbles as you move down. It reminds me of the Daleks <laughs> and so when I wear it I always think of this as my pink fluffy Dalek jumper <laughs> but it's really super cozy it feels it feels like a big warm hug and uh, that's why I chose to wear it today because I felt like I needed a big warm pink hug. The pattern is by Jojo Tricot who is Paula Lem uh, you'll find her at jojo.trico on Instagram. I will leave her details and the details for this pattern in the show notes, which you'll be able to find a link to in the description box below. That link will take you to my Patreon and the show notes are hosted there. It is free to view them. You're not charged for looking at the show notes <laughs> and you will see that uh, I've got images, I've got pictures, I've got hyperlinks, uh, so it's a little bit more, it's a little bit uh, more uh, detailed and uh, I'm not limited by my character count like I am in the description box on YouTube because my show notes always seem to, to run a little excessive. So. <laughs> so anything that I talk about, you can go and find over there. Um, the Patreon actually is, you know, is open for you to, to join as well if you want to support me over there. For the lowest uh, tier, the lowest subscription point, you receive these videos 24 hours before everybody else does. And uh, so if you want to, to join and support me, then you can do that over there. Okay, the other thing I'm wearing is this, and this is my Chili Chocolate Roy Bosch hat which is a pattern by Claire Devine. I think she did it in collaboration with Ginger Twist Studio, which is one of my local yarn shops in Edinburgh. Um, and Jess at Ginger Twist produces this wonderful hand-dyed yarn. And she did produce a colorway called Chili Chocolate Roy Bosch that accompanied this pattern. This is not the same yarn, although I do have that yarn and I have it knitted up as a different hat. <laughs> but, um, but yes, and they did it in collaboration with Pico Tea, which is a tea company here in Edinburgh. And so it was done as, as a collection called the Tea Collection. And this is one of the patterns from that. So I will take it off so you can see because it's a lace pattern. And I chose it because it was an iron weight pattern and it's very pretty and it's um, a beanie. So it sits close to my head 
like this. It's super comfy. And I used my leftovers from the from the Lily's Bobble sweater for, for my hat. <laughs> so there you go, that's what I'm wearing. But what have I finished? Well, you can kind of see it here. <laughs> Hiding in plain sight. I finished the jumper that I was knitting for my son, Seb. So this is it here. It's <laughs> it's a big jumper <laughs> and it is the single malt sweater which is by Maxim Sear. You'll find him as Max the Knitter on Instagram and uh, I've knitted it in Holst. So this is Holst Super Soft held with Holst Titicaca. Now Holst Super Soft is well, you've heard me talk about it a lot, but it's about 50% Merino, 50% Shetland, and the Titicaca is 100% Alpaca. The Titicaca, oh, I can show you here. The Titicaca is a lace weight um, Alpaca, so you can hold it one strand together with your um, four plier fingering weight, which will then give you, a, I suppose, like a light sport weight. It does not give you the same kind of fluff as you would get, I'll see if I can show you that, the halo. Um, it won't give you the same fluff that you would get from mohair, but it does have a little bit of a halo because there are kind of longer, longer strands. So it does have a bit of fluff. It does soften up the fabric quite significantly. And um, I think it would be a really good substitute for people who don't want a lot of fluff, who don't want the kind of shed that you sometimes get with, um, with mohair. And, uh, but also for when you want to do a pattern that tells you, you know, to hold a, stri hold a strand of mohair, you can hold a strand of this lace weight alpaca instead, and it will give you the right yarn weight. Talking about yarn weight, this pattern is not designed for this yarn weight. <laughs> this pattern is designed for Aran weight. So, and like I said, I think I've probably got sport weight here. So it's significantly lighter weight than the original pattern has called for. Uh, so what I did was I knitted my swatch uh, to get a, a fabric that I liked. And so I knitted a couple of swatches got one that I like the best. I think it was on 4.5 millimeter needles and um, counted how many stitches I got per inch. So I, I counted it over four inches and then divided it by four to figure out how to put my roll gauge, sorry, my stitch gauge was going to be over one inch. And then I knew that I wanted the chest measurement to be 44 inches. So then I multiplied my stitch gauge over one inch by 44 and that showed me how many stitches would give me at my gauge would give me 44 inches and then I looked at the pattern and I found a size that had exact it had exactly that number of stitches uh, after the sleeve separation and that size was size seven so I think it's a size four that gives you 44 inches but I knitted a size seven and at my gauge, it's given me exactly 44 inches for the chest. So it was pretty successful. I was a little bit concerned. I mean, this doesn't all I mean, you have to be careful when you are uh, modifying for, for gauge and for weight. And I think for some jumpers, it's not as easy to, to make that switch. But for this one, it was relatively simple. I was slightly concerned that maybe the depth of the raglan was too deep. Uh, Seb has not tried this on yet. He'll be trying it on when I give it to him tomorrow, hence today's podcast. <laughs> but um, but yes, I'm hopeful that actually it's going to be okay. I tried it on myself and it wasn't actually as deep as I, as I was concerned it was. Um, so actually it's worked out pretty effectively um, just to, to knit that size to get the the right measurements so for any kind of um for any kind of measurement i would use size four and for any stitch count i would use size seven and that's basically how i how i modified it so a very simple and straightforward modification and uh, not not too complex at all but i think it's been quite effective I spoke last time that actually this is the third this was the third time I'd cast it on because 
twice. Uh, I cast on the number of stitches but uh, that was requested in the pattern but of course because it's Aran weight and I was knitting a smaller weight on smaller needles the, the neck was far too small and so I ended up ripping it back and then on my second attempt I still thought it was a bit tight but I thought it might do and then I messed up the short rows and I ended up creating like a short row wedge that kind of sat over one shoulder which is a bit weird. <laughs> Um, so I debated about whether I could fix it or whether I should rip back the short row shaping um, and I decided actually I was just going to um, begin again and start again with an even looser cast on. So basically I cast on with a five millimeter needle. I did a German twisted cast on. I knitted the first row with five millimeter needle and then I went down a size. Uh, so that's that's what I ended up doing. So starting with a larger needle and then dropping after the first row to kind of create a little bit more give in the in the neck. And I think that's been effective, but we will find out tomorrow when he tries to put it over his head. I will feed back. <laughs> we'll see. It's a very long jumper, but he, re he really likes a long jumper. Uh, there are details in this that genuinely delight me. For example, the neck band here is a two by one rib and that two by one rib extends down as a detail for the raglan decreases and then also down, continues on down the sleeve and then into the, into the, the ribbing at the cuff. So that's, that's really lovely. Also with the way that you create the underarm decreases. You kind of, I don't know if you can see that, you almost have like a, what looks like a gusset here, which I think is very neat. The texture, the overall texture is very easy to do, particularly because every second row is just a plain knit row. So you're getting a, a break from doing all of the one by one uh, knitting. And the fabric, I'm so happy with it. I'm really pleased with it. it. Super soft always blocks beautifully because it has a lot of spinning oil in it. It sometimes looks a little bit stringy, you know, it looks a bit thin. Um, but actually once you've washed it uh, and the excess dye and spinning oil is removed and um, the whole, the, the stitches and the, the fabric really kind of plumps up and it fills out. And I think with the addition of the of the Titicaca has created this really interesting fabric which I think really highlights the texture and I'll just show you. So you can see, you can't sort of see through it because it is a lighter weight jumper but that's exactly what, what Seb wanted and what he asked for. So he wanted it to be a piece that he could layer um, so he could layer things underneath it or something that he could wear with just like a long sleeve t-shirt and then he can wear his jacket on the top. Um, I'm hopeful that this will be a real stable piece for him in his in his wardrobe. So like I said, I give it to him tomorrow. So uh, let's hope it fits him and let's hope he loves it. So that's my, that's my finished object. <laughs> And so I have a couple of works in progress. One which you've seen before, which is this one. This is the Cinnabar shawl by Andrea Mowry. And it's a brioche shawl. And I've made quite a lot of progress. Gosh, that striping looks really distinct in the camera. It looks more distinct in the camera, I think, than it does in person. But uh, two thirds of the shawl is done in brioche and the other third is in this stitch here which is created by knitting and purling each stitch, each sorry, each row twice. So when you get to the end of your row, un you don't just turn over and start knitting the other side, you slip all your stitches back to the beginning of the, of the needle and you knit that row again. Uh, as you would with brioche. Uh, but it creates this really interesting, it's really interesting definition in the fabric. Um, I'm using Drops, what is it? It's Drops Alaska, 
no it's not, it's Drops Charisma, <laughs> which is 100% superwash wool and it is in the colour Grape, as is it here, and it's a DK weight. You can see it's quite a round, plump yarn, a lot of fun to work with. And I am also using this one here, which is, oh dear, I'm all tangled up which is Orangery, which is a Shoppel Zauberball, a crazy Zauberball. So this is the, you can see the, I always like how they do this on the labels. You can really see the shades that the, the yarn is going to move through. Um, it's very fun. It's very addictive because you want to see, <laughs> you want to see the colours change in your knitting. What I would say is it's quite thin. So if you see Gosh, where is it? There it is. The, the DK and the Zauber Ball together, you see they're vastly different weights here. Now, the original pattern recommends spin cycle, I think dyed in the wool, and does not um, recommend this uh, vast difference in, in yarn weights. So this is... Uh, I suppose this is a modification. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing with a shawl. It really, it really depends on what kind of fabric you get and whether you like that fabric. And, um, and if you have enough of the yarn, as we discovered with my quadrangle spires, sometimes yarn modifications don't always work and sometimes they require a little bit of creativity. But, um, but yes, as long as you like the, the, the fabric that you're getting, you know, why not? play around with different yarn weights because what this has resulted in, you see, is we have these quite delicate stitches, which is the Zauber ball, and it's uh, going through these fun colour changes. And then on the other side, these really kind of plump and bouncy columns of the, of the DK. And I think that's really fun. And, you know, brioche is all about the kind of the bouncy fabric. You know, one of the things people always talk about is how squishy <laughs> brioche is because it has a lot of volume to it because of the construction of the fabric. So this, uh, this I think, just kind of exacerbates or exaggerates the, the squish of the, of the brioche fabric that you're, that you're creating. So that's a lot of fun. It's uh, very easy to knit. If you are if you are familiar with brioche, then um, this is the kind of this this for me this is my TV knitting because it's it's relatively straightforward. Um, and if you're not familiar with brioche knitting, this could still be a, a pretty easy beginner pattern for you if you like it. Um, there are some increases done in brioche on either on either side to, to create the shawl shape. Um, but other than that, it's just the basic knit and purl and brioche stitch. So there we go. And for those who have been with me for a while, you might remember that I've knitted one of these already. I knitted one for my gran and I gave it to her last January and it was knitted in another Zalber ball. I can't remember the name of that one now but it was a dark purple and pink one that went into sort of mossy greens. And I had a really beautiful hand dyed uh, yarn, which was sort of like, a, I suppose like a mid pink, um, a real sort of rose pink. And it was, uh, it was beautiful. And I paired those two up together and I knitted the cinnabar. And it was just really earlier on last month that I decided that I really needed a brioche project on my needles and I had that project pattern in my in my library and decided that I had the yarn I would just cast it on. You know I do think there is something to be said for for knitting these patterns that we that we purchase more than once and really sort of making the the use out of the of the money that we've spent on these patterns. I, I really am a big advocate of knitting more more than one of, of something as you as you all know. <laughs> Oftentimes when I get to the end of a project, I quite often feel like I'm not ready to be finished with it. I'm not ready to be done with it. And sometimes that leads me to cast another one on immediately. Um, sometimes I just dream about casting on another one or I plan for a future one. 
So um, I'm really happy to have cast this one on and uh, I'm looking forward to, to finishing it and wearing it. The construction of the shawl, I should just say, is created with repeats. So you do this first piece here and then this section here, you reverse the colours for your for your brioche. So all of a sudden your main colour becomes your secondary colour and vice versa. And you only do that for like for four rows and then you slip and you move back into making your primary colour your main colour again and then doing it again, switching them round here. So this is one repeat here, going from here to here, and then this is a second repeat from here to here. And I think you do three or four repeats all together before you do a, a border. And of course your rows are getting longer and longer. So I do still have quite a lot of knitting still to go with this uh, with this shawl. It will be a large, generous shawl because, uh, because I like a large, generous shawl. So there we go. That's, uh, that's us. That's that whip. Next whip is one that you've not seen. So I will show that to you now. It's in this, it's in this bag here. <laughs> so the lovely Mega of the Skeins of Dreams podcast has launched a Blankets of Dreams Mal. It's a make along so you can knit or you can crochet or you can weave or you can, you know, what, whatever you want to do in order to make your make your blanket is all good with her. But I've decided, of course, to knit my blanket. And you might remember me showing that bag, that bag full of leftovers quite a wee while ago now. And I was trying to decide what I wanted to do with all of them. And well, I've finally settled on a pattern and Mega has given me the, the motivation to finally cast it on and start working through my leftovers. So the blanket that I've cast on is called the Melting Marl Blanket by Stephen West. It's a new pattern. It just came out last month, I think. It is, here's mine. It is such a fun pattern because this is section one that I've completed so far. Section two is another chevron but um, with a different design and the same with section three. So there's going to be like three different stitch patterns repeated over the same number of rows. So you end up with this and then you repeat the, that set of three, I think it's four times. It's going to be massive because it's already like super, super long. So as you can see, I've started mine in black and purple, like a black and a dark purple. And then I've moved up towards sort of gray and sort of a lighter purple, then moving into these kind of really sort of jammy shades and then into this kind of magenta pink, I suppose, with a lighter gray. It looks, I'm really liking how it looks from a distance. When you get a bit close to it, I suppose it's like a, um, like a Monet painting or something like that, isn't it? The, the, when, you're, when, you're, when you've got the distance on it, you sometimes see it a little bit better. But there we go. It looks really cool. So in the Melting Marl Blanket, what Stephen West recommends is that you knit with two strands of fingering weight held together and then you swap out one strand for another before you swap out the next like that you know so so you are creating a marl that then fades through and that's exactly what I'm doing so this um on one side on one side one yarn is I don't even know how to kind of describe this I suppose let's call them yarn stories one yarn story, colour story, is a neutral one. So it is going from black through to white. The other yarn colour story is going from purple through to red, through to orange, through to yellow. Uh, so uh, when I swap out a uh, um, black for a grey, um, that's all going, that's all being marled alongside the purple, marling into pink, marling into red. So there's going to be a neutral 
held with a colour the whole way through. I hope I've described that well. <laughs> So yes, that's what, that's what I've started with. So I've started with the dark purple and the black and then moved up through into this. What am I currently using? I'm currently holding these two together. This is a Drops Nord, uh, which is a Drops Alpaca um, wool and nylon blend. And it's kind of, like I said, it's kind of in this sort of magenta shade. And this yarn, I think I picked this up in a charity shop and it's called Lister's Lavenda. Lavenda? It says, made in England by Lister & Co Limited Bradford. It's 100% wool. It's sold by the ounce. So that gives you an idea of how old this yarn must be because in the UK we no longer sell by the ounce. Uh, we moved to, to metric a while ago. Uh, <laughs> So it doesn't give you a meterage, but I did manage to find this yarn on Ravelry. So I did a little um, search on the yarns for, for this Lister Lavender and discovered that it's 120 meters per ball. So that was information I didn't have. And I have four balls of this. You can see here, this one looks a little bit light. This looks a bit smaller than the other two. But uh, but yes, so that's what I'm that's what I'm using. My idea is is that I'm going to move, like I said, from black through to grey, through to white, purple through to red, through to orange, through to yellow, and I as I'm going, I'm weighing my yarn. So I'm weighing, for example, let me find this is the black yarn that I used to begin with. So I weighed it to see how much I had and then I used up half of what I had because what I want to do is to then reverse my colours going from white to black and yellow to purple um, on the other side. So what I hopefully end up with is a symmetrical blanket. I may have bitten off more than I can chew. <laughs> One of my problems is, is that my um, kitchen scales are not terribly accurate. And so before I started this project, I decided that what I really needed was these. And these are very tiny digital scales. So basically I take off the, this bit here and I balance it on top and then it's got the on off button and then I can pop my yarn and weigh it and then I'm taking notes in my notepad and uh, then I know how much yarn I can use on this first half so that when I do go back to knit the second half I won't have to weigh anything I can just I can just go so that's the plan <laughs> like I said we'll, we'll, we'll see how successful that plan is and how well it works out but I think it should be okay I'll show you some of the other colors that I've got I'm going to be moving through this beautiful, this is Smoked Sock by Olan. I don't, cannot remember the colourway, um, but it's absolutely beautiful. I think it's got some cashmere in it. And then what else do I have? I have this skein here of Indesita, which is this lovely orangey, kind of like a heathered orange and yellow. Uh, and it's by Ficolana and it's 100% alpaca. Uh, what else do I have? I've got this, which is baby alpaca from oh, BC Garn. I think that's what that is anyway. Lots of things in here. Um, I've got some leftover John Arban. I've got yarn that I've dyed myself. That one, oh, there's another one that I've dyed myself, this one here. This lovely sort of rusty red color. And then for the neutrals, I have, gosh, I don't even, oh, I think this is Yak, undyed. And this is also Baby Alpaca from BC Garn. And I picked up a skein of the Camaro's Midnight Sol which is 54% baby alpaca, 36% tensile and 10% merino. And it's just in a white 
uh, undyed so I thought I'll hold that and that'll give a little bit of interesting texture. Uh, there's some super soft, of course. <laughs> oh, there's this very old uh, D it's called DK Soft by um, Rowan. I was absolutely mad about this when it came out. Gosh, it must be <laughs> about 20 years ago. And I've still got, I think I've got some cream as well. And this is beige. Um, but I don't know about you, but I never felt this was a, this never looked to me as though it was a DK weight. It always looked like it was a finer weight, but because of the halo, perhaps it could be knitted up as DK. But, uh, but yes. I'm going to be using it as a as a four ply in the context of this blanket. So super lovely and, and fluffy. I don't know what the makeup of it is. I don't know what the blend actually is, but it's a, a single ply. Like I said, it's very old. I don't think it's still available. Uh, so yes, I've got lots and lots of yarn here. And like I said, I'm just working through each, each ball and I'm weighing it. I am knitting half of it into the blanket. My hope is that by the time I get through the second repeat of the three sections that I will be nearing the lightest shade of yellow and my white um, maybe even just with a solid white section just with a little bit of fluff. Um, I do have some unbleached, um, oh I, have, I think it's bleached actually, I think I have some bleached white um, super soft. That I'm going to be that I could use for the for like a central piece to, so that it creates that transition from one uh, from one colorway into the next one color story into the next um so yes it's a long project this has taken me quite a long time to knit uh it's not super speedy and that's okay it doesn't need to be super speedy it's a fun blanket project <laughs> Uh, the pattern is really easy to memorise. Once you've got it memorised, you've got it. I am using stitch markers to keep track of where my decreases need to go in the pattern. Uh, I find that quite helpful when I just want to kind of sit and tune out and, you know, watch a TV show or something while I'm while I'm working on it. Um, but yes, it's all it's garter, um, garter stitch with a little bit of lace. So there's some increases, some. Um, yarn overs and some decreases but it's really pretty straightforward and a lot of fun. So there you go that's for the Blankets of blankets of Dreams Mal and it's the Stephen West Melting Marl Blanket knitted up in scraps and I am hopeful that this will use up some of my scraps and leftovers because honestly I have the most ridiculous number of scraps. I would say the majority of my stash right now consists of cones and leftovers. <laughs> so, so yes I'd like to get through some of these leftovers and uh, create, create a bit more space in my in my yarn storage. That would be good and it would feel good to do. And not only that it would result in a wonderful big squishy blanket. So there you go. That's the the whip that you've not seen. What else? I'm sure there was something else. Was, oh yes, of course. I have, as you know, I was knitting the single malt for Sebi, who is my middle child, and I'm going to be knitting for my daughter. Now I can't find. Oh, there it is. It's dropped on the floor. I'm going to be knitting the Peated Whiskey. They both chose independently, just FYI. Neither of them knew the name of the pattern the other one had chosen. <laughs> but one chose Single Malt and the other chose Peated Whiskey um, by Thea Coleman. And it's a beautiful cabled cardigan. And uh, she wanted, my daughter wanted it in a colour called Slate Grey, uh, which is a holst, super soft and I bought the cone and I am knitting holding double so because again it's quite it's quite thin yarn I think the pattern is knitted for worsted weight um, so using my very handy yarn dispenser aka <laughs> toilet uh, no uh, kitchen toilet <laughs> kitchen 
kitchen drawer dispenser. It's not a toilet roll dispenser. <laughs> I used my um, my winder, ball winder, to create individual cakes so that I can then hold them double. The pattern said to use a lot for the large needle a 5.5 millimeter. So um, and very handily your gauge square can then serve as a pocket on the finished article. So I cast on for the pocket <laughs> at, in, in 5.5 millimeter, well, using 5.5 millimeter needles holding the super soft double and I washed and blocked it and this is what I got. Can, uh, you can see the cables much better in person, they're not really showing up here but you can kind of see them. Uh, I was a little bit concerned that the fabric was a bit too thin, it was a bit too gaping. Uh, actually, when I measured for gauge, I was half an inch over. Uh, so I got think this came to five inches from here to here, and it only was supposed to be, it was only supposed to be four and a half. So I cast on a second swatch and I went down to five millimeter needles I got a much better density of fabric. I think you'll see the, um, in fact, you can even see here that the, the cables pop much better. There's much more plumpness to the, to the cable work. You can see there to the texture and it ended up being 4.5 from here to here. So it was the right gauge and it was a better fabric overall so I'm quite glad actually about going down. That's why it's so important to do your gauge swatches and I know I you know I'm not a big fan of a gauge swatch. I don't really like doing them <laughs> if I'm completely honest. But I've learned the hard way <laughs> that they are really worthwhile doing, particularly when it's a big project. You know this is an all over cabled cardigan. It is going to take all the the whole cone of yarn and it's going to take a lot of um, hours and of my knitting time. Uh, so if I had just decided to go for it with the 5.5 millimeter needles, this cardigan would end up, well, it would end up too thin, the cables wouldn't have stood out properly and it would have ended up far too big. And my daughter is a petite woman and so I don't want I don't want her cardigan to swamp her. I want it to be a cozy, lovely hug from her mama, but I don't want her to feel as though she's drowning in it. <laughs> I want it to fit her. <laughs> so um so yes, I'm really pleased that I then went down the needle size and um and did the second gauge swatch. And I really love that the gauge swatch now isn't wasted. But actually becomes a pocket. So I'll be knitting the other pocket <laughs> later on today, which is why this stands as a work in progress. <laughs> so we're one pocket down on the um, Thea Coleman's um, Peated Whiskey, that's what it's called. Just to, just to show you again, I don't know if you can see, this is the one on the smaller needles, this is the one on the bigger needles. So it really did make quite a difference. Um, to the fabric and to the and to the look of the fabric, so so I'm really pleased with that, and I'm going to crack on with that, and uh, I will have quite a bit more done on that. I think next time I next time I speak to you. So that's what I'm working on. Uh, I do have one other thing that I'm working on, but it sits in the mending section. So what am I mending right now? Well, what I'm mending right now is my rocket tea. So this is a beautiful, beautiful pattern by Tannis Lavely and the yarn, I absolutely love my yarn. This was a uh, Qing fibre mohair silk, which was one of the skeins that I received in their club subscription last year. And it, I paired it with a uh, Isaire's Highland Wool in the colourway Sky. Can you see the variegation in that colour? It is, oh, it's almost like an opal, you know, it's almost opalescent. It's just absolutely beautiful, I love it. So it's really cute, it's got these um, eyelets for the, um, 
for the increases for your raglan and these increases or these um rag these uh, lace detail features then down the sides of the for the seams. It's very lightweight, um, probably to be worn with a little camisole underneath in the summertime or perhaps over a, a dress, a sundress. It could also be very pretty. But I made a mistake with it. And I think, I, I mean, I'm sure I must have shown this to you last year, but I don't think I ever showed it to you finished. And I don't think I ever showed it to you being worn. In fact, I know I didn't because it's never been worn. And it kind of sits in my drawer and every time I pass over I feel a little bit sad because it's so nearly exactly what I want but not quite and because of that I don't wear it. And that feels a bit sad because it's a beautiful pattern like I said and you know Tannis has obviously gone to a lot of effort to, to make this a lovely pattern which is fun to knit and looks good when you wear it and and then the yarn itself you know and I think about you know, the people at Ching Fibre who have, you know, so beautifully dyed up this, this colourway and come up with the colour combination and sent it out into the world, you know, thinking about what people might make with it and how much they'll enjoy opening up their little their little package of mohair silk. And then, you know, thinking about the, the Azair yarn, you know, in this incredibly beautiful blend. And, you know, can you imagine coming up with that blend and then seeing the ball of it for the first time and how it worked up and how excited you were and putting these gorgeous resources out into the world for us to use and knit into our beautiful projects and the time and the energy and the effort and then the connections to our lineage and um, how this piece is going to live on after after we are no longer here and you know etc 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 and what's it doing it's sitting in my drawer making me feel sad <laughs> and that feels like it, a wholly undeserving end result for something which should be bringing lots of joy and pleasure so what did I do wrong well the mistake that I made was I followed the pattern I think I pretty much followed the pattern the whole way through apart from the very end when I decided that when you do the I-cord cast off, that I was going to use a bigger needle. And my thinking was, was that was going to create kind of a looser um, edge. I didn't want it to be too tight. I didn't want it to pull in. Um, and so I went up a needle size. And it's oh, what happened when well, you can see it on this, is I ended up with what seems like quite exaggerated, with a very exaggerated cast off, rather than like a nice neat, cast off you can see it very much so in the the neck it just doesn't look right at all um, so I am um, ripping back the cast offs uh, I'm ripping back that I cord and I'm going to work something different so this morning I ripped back the I cord from the hem the, from on the body and I took back the first stripe and I picked up my stitches using the smallest fixed circular needles that I have. I think these are 2.25s. And uh, I'm really excited to now knit on this. I'm going to use my 3.5. I think it was knitted on a 3.75, so I'm going to go down to 3.5. And I'm going to just knit an inch of rib in this easier yarn to come and then do a straightforward cast off um, for the body and then I'm going to go back and see if I, I think I have some of the Azair Sky left in my stash. I think I had a little bit left over so if I do then I think I've got a little bit of the mohair left over too so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and then knit a little bit onto the sleeves to create a bit more of a cap so I have a bit more of a cap sleeve and then um, and then I'm going to cast off again using the Isair um, Highland wool and the same on the other side and then I'm going to take back the eye cord off the neckline and I'm going to figure out a workaround for that which might include um, doing some 
dec- like c- center decreases up the front and just knitting it uh, a couple of rows of rib and then casting off. So there is quite a lot, when I talk it through like that, there, it does seem like there's quite a lot that needs to be done on it. But the truth is, is it's sitting in the drawer, not being worn, not doing anything. So, you know, if I don't do this work to complete it in a way that makes it wearable for me, then, you know, it's a, it's a lot of hours and a lot of beautiful yarn um, and, you know, a lot of effort wasted. And, I, and I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to do that. So, so there we go. That's what I'm mending right now. Hopefully, by the next time we speak, I will have that in a wearable state and that will make me really really happy okay so that's what i'm wearing that's what i've finished that's what i'm working on and that's what i've mended what have i received (laughs) or bought as the case might be (laughs) well i got a lovely gift from my mum which i will share with you Oh, I also got some beautiful stitch markers that she gave to me and I haven't brought them through, so I'll show you them next time. But she gave me this beautiful yarn and this is from her local yarn shop in Cognac, uh, which is My Little Mai. And she bought me this beautiful Fonty yarn, it's a Fonty moustache. And you can see it's like a silver grey, this gorgeous rosy pink. And then this bottom colour here, it's blowing out a little bit, but it's a beautiful soft shell pink. The moustache blend is so interesting. Where is it? Super kid, 30% super kid mohair, 20% silk and 50% merino. It is so soft. It's sold in 50 gram balls and each 50 gram ball has 225 meters. So um, it's, I suppose it's uh, a slightly lighter weight fingering. Um, and I have two balls of each colour. So I'm thinking shawl, but I haven't decided what shawl yet. Um, but it's, it's so soft. I cannot tell you how soft it is. Um, can you see? It's got this kind of, the, the, oh, you can see it there, I think. The mohair gives it this really lovely halo, but the silk content makes it this really bright, glossy, um, shade and the, the the merino is just well it's, it's just woolly soft goodness isn't it <laughs> so there we go that's one gift that I received and I oh yes and the other thing is I bought so I bought a cone of yarn you're shocked I know shocking but it's from Wooly Knit it's from their British wool um, and it's their, their 50 gram cones uh, this is in the colour burgundy. It's this really beautiful rich red. I also really like the halo that you get on these. Really stunning. I think they are popping their prices up really soon so that might be something to be aware of. I bought this um, to participate in Crea Bea, Rebecca of Crea Bea. Um, her um, collaboration with Wooly Knit uh, is the cone along and so she has a discount code which is single use but I decided I was going to use it to buy this cone here. Now I think I will be participating in the cone along using this cone because I really want to get my girl's um, cardigan done for her and uh, before I start on my other son's jumper, uh, my youngest. Uh, so more about that in the next podcast. But uh, this will be for me. (laughs) I keep having visions of it paired with like a really hot pink, like much hotter than this, like, you know, hot. (laughs) Um, And I've got an idea of a colour work pattern that I want to try. Um, It's from from one of my books and I am trying to use my resources a little bit more consciously this year. So I want to try and use some of these patterns in my books. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about that. Maybe, maybe I might get a swatch knitted up and then I'll be able to show you that on the next, on the next episode. But there you go, there's my, my woolly knit cone. And the other thing that I bought, well, I bought this yesterday. So that comes with a little bit of a story. So obviously with the lockdowns and the pandemic, uh, dentists were not allowed to take uh, clients 
and they of course have started to take clients again and there's been a bit of a backlog but anyway we managed to to get an appointment uh, last week and I discovered that uh, I needed a filling so this is the first filling that I've ever had and uh, so that was a bit disappointing <laughs> but it's because I have an impacted wisdom tooth and the tooth that it's resting against is where um, is where this uh, cavity is. So I had to go yesterday back to the dentist and have this cavity um, sorted. I am not a very good dental patient. I, I get very nervous and um, I, I get a little bit distressed around the whole thing and, and then um, of course my mouth was all numb and I was uh, feeling quite sorry for myself. The only way I got through it was when I was having the treatment done, I imagined that I was in Death in Paradise. Have you seen that show? <laughs> I love Death in Paradise. It's a BBC murder mystery show. Um, and although it sounds as though it might be a bit gruesome, it's it's not a very gruesome show at all. And I was imagining that I was um, at Catherine's bar having a rum punch while I was having my tooth drilled. So that's what got me through that part. <laughs> <laughs> the part that got me across the, the door of the dentist in the first place was telling myself that after I got this work done, I could walk over to Ginger Twist and uh, to Jessie's and I could buy myself a treat. I got the latest edition of Pom Pom. So, <laughs> so I picked up Pom Pom and then I got the bus home and I sat um, on my sofa and yeah, worked on my blanket, read my magazine and dribbled my tea <laughs> and felt generally quite sorry for myself for the rest of the day. Mouth feeling much better today, incidentally. If my mouth was still swollen, we would not be podcasting. So, <laughs> so yes, feeling significantly better today, thank goodness. And uh, this is just beautiful. I love so many of the patterns in it. Uh, and I'm really excited to experiment with them and have a proper play with them. This is the first pattern that I saw from this new pom-pom that made me go, wow, like I, I want to knit that, like that's a proper, I mean it's going to like massively take me out of my uh, comfort zone but that's what I love and there's instructions for you know either replicating the exact design or you can you know paint with your yarn and you can you can create your own your own patterns uh, within the fabric. The fabric is created with intarsia and I think that might be one of the very few knitting techniques that I have not tried so I think I might need uh, an intarsia project between <laughs> never having done it before and casting this on <laughs> but um but I do absolutely adore this pattern and uh, I'm very excited by it the pattern that I kind of thought I'd be interested in but actually once I got it discovered I'm madly interested in it and desperately want to cast it on is this one here it's called floaty and it's this amazing color work cardigan you can see it here isn't that gorgeous? And you use like three, you use these six colours all together. Three of them are mohair and three are not. Three are fingering weight. And then you're making this fabulous kind of checkerboard of colour, which I just absolutely love, which is made through stranded colour work. Well, that sent me going through my stash and wondering what, what I could use or what I might need to supplement. <laughs> but I'm really excited by that one. Uh, my daughter, when she's and her friend, when they saw this one, absolutely loved that too. So I'm going to keep that in mind uh, for perhaps a future, future gift knit. I thought the lace on this is called the, it's called the Nereids. And it is absolutely stunning. I love the yarn combination. Um, but uh, it's I think that's just beautiful. Really interesting shape as well. Then there's this one here, which can either be a dress or can be a, a mohair top using 
two shades of mohair. This one uses undyed mohair and then uses up your scraps. Well, that's appealing for lots of reasons. And then there's this one here as well with this little this little mohair frill over this lace um, yoke, which I think is, you can see it there, that's the one that's on the cover, which I think is also really pretty and might be something really fun to experiment with. So my rule of thumb for buying a magazine like Pom Pom or Lina, because um, our making, I mean, all of these magazines are very high quality and um, they are, and because of that, they are quite expensive. So then I need to um, see the patterns in them and really make a decision about whether, would I knit just one pattern? Would I knit more than one pattern? And then really trying to make up my, dis my mind on, on that because I don't want to be buying more. I don't want to buy something just because, you know, well, just because. I want to buy it because it's got some kind of use and it makes sense to get it. So um, so I would definitely knit more than one project out of Pom Pom. So this time around, the Dreamscape issue. Very excited about that. So there we go. So that's my... That's my, uh, what I've bought and what I've received. What's bringing me joy? Well, one of the things that's bringing me joy is family lunches. So just at the point where my children uh, were flying the nest, and as I said that, a pigeon just flew past my window. <laughs> just at the point where my children were flying the nest, uh, that's when COVID hit and we moved into lockdowns. And because of that, my um, we were communicating obviously through video chat or um, we were having um, distanced visits or sometimes we weren't allowed distance visits at all. And it all felt obviously, as you know, for, for everybody, it felt very fraught and a, a difficult process. Now that things are transitioning into a new phase and we're not in lockdown anymore and we are able to see each other much more freely, I decided that I didn't, I wasn't happy with the default that we had slipped into as a family. You know, when you move into these kind of big transitional moments, you know, it's really important, I think, to begin that in the way in which you, you want to proceed it. And we hadn't been able to do that because of the lockdowns. So I either then, you know, find a, a place of peace with that new default, or I create something different. And I decided to create something different. So now we're going to be having monthly family lunches. Uh, they're going to be potluck, so everybody gets to bring some food along and um, and we'll host them, or my brother will host them, and we'll be able to, to connect as a, as a big family again and, and get current with each other and check in with one another and make sure that those bonds are staying really strong and healthy and um, we're touching in with, you know, what, what we're challenged by and, and what our joys are and you know, all of those good things and celebrate, you know, just being with one another. So, so family lunches. So we had our first family lunch uh, last month and our next family lunch will be this month. And I'm really excited about that. And that feels like a very positive claiming of how I want our family dynamic to, to be moving forward. Uh, the other thing, another thing that's bringing me joy was that my youngest son and his girlfriend came over to stay with us last weekend and uh, it was because his girlfriend was singing with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra as part of the female chorus that accompanied um, the orchestra for Sinfonia Antarctica, which is a piece by Vaughan Williams. And so we went out and we had lovely Mexican food beforehand and then we got to go and watch her perform in the Usher Hall. And that was really special. And that was really a, a, a lovely, a lovely event. So that was bringing me joy. Uh, I had my daughter and her best friend come and stay over with us uh, just this week, a couple of days ago. I had decided uh, Christmas 2019 that <laughs> instead of buying things for people, I was going to buy experiences. So I bought tickets for people to go to concerts or to performances or, you know, that kind of thing. And then, of course, the majority of them weren't used because uh, everything changed in March. But one of those tickets, I well, two of those tickets I gave to my daughter for her and her friend to see Dita Von Tees 
doing her burlesque show um, at the Playhouse in Edinburgh. And of course it was postponed and it was postponed and it was postponed until this week when it finally happened. So she and her best friend went out and they um, absolutely loved the show. They got all dressed up and, and said that everybody there was all dressed up and there was lovely positivity and, and camaraderie amongst everybody that was there. Lots of compliments going around, lots of building up other women. It sounded really lovely and positive. And then they went out dancing and um, Aurora's best friend told me that that was the first time that she had been out dancing in two years. And I just thought, oh, do you know what? And they were high as kites. Um, and just so excited and happy about, you know, having this, this night out. And I thought, again, it's, it's just a real marker for, um, you know, for this, ex this collective experience we've been moving through over the, last, over the last few years. But it was just really lovely to see and experience their, their joy and uh, their excitement at being able to see this, this fabulous performer. Uh, Seb's jumper has made me really joyful too because it's the first of three to get completed and uh, I'm going to see him tomorrow and uh, going to meet up for, for coffee and I'm going to give it to him and I really hope it fits him but, uh, but I'm really excited to, to be giving that over to him. Uh, talking about tickets and performances, uh, my husband Frank surprised me with tickets for us to go and see the Fleet Foxes. Uh, they're going to also be performing at the Usher Hall in August. Uh, he gave them to me on the day, the tw which is the 25th anniversary of the day that we met. Uh, so that was that was at the end of February. So that was a really lovely surprise. And uh, and so, yeah, we're going to be going out to going out to a concert in in August. So that's uh, something lovely to look forward to. Uh, there's been a lot of chaos and disruption in my flat recently because we got our boiler replaced and our heating system and uh, plumbing system sorted when we took off the, the piping boxes in preparation for this work to be done. We discovered that the whole property was plumbed in lead and so it hasn't been updated. So we got a lot of that um, updated. And, and switched up and we got a new boiler put in. We got a hot water tank taken out to create some cupboard space in our bedroom. Uh, but it mean that the whole place has been in an uproar and all my bedroom furniture has been in the living room. And because, all, because everything was cleared out of the bedroom, I decided that I would take that opportunity to paint one of the walls because one of the walls um, was wallpapered in kind of like a black flocked wallpaper and which wasn't really my style. So I decided that I was going to take that off and I was going to paint it. So I chose this really cool color, which I'm going to share with you here. It's kind of like a, a, a warm terracotta, I think. Uh, it's called Cushion Craze, which I'm not really sure is entirely relevant to the actual color it is, but uh, that's what it's called. <laughs> it was by Crown and it was part of their L decoration uh, range. And uh, so we got the wall all stripped off. We revealed some rather interesting uh, layers underneath and <laughs> eventually got it all stripped off, prepared the wall. My brother came over and helped me put up lining paper on the wall. And then we got two coats of this up and we've now managed to move all the bedroom furniture back out of the lounge, thus freeing up a place to, to sit other than on the futon. <laughs> And, uh, and our bedroom is, is on its way to getting sorted, but it has this lovely warm terracotta feature wall now. So I'm really pleased with that. And that is bringing me joy. Online, I've been watching, well, I saw um, the new Caddy Jack's bonus episode and that brought me a huge amount of joy. It was featuring Jackie with her son, Heron, which was lovely to meet him. And she had also knitted him a jumper. And so they were looking at that jumper together and the experience of, of knitting it and of wearing it. And that was that was lovely. And then we had a bit with Lily and Sally. And that was such a delight to share some time with them and to, to share in their creativity and um, their creative process and, and what they've been making. So I really enjoyed that. And that was that was a delight from start to finish. So highly recommend that. 
Uh, the other thing I've been really enjoying online is the La Bien Aimé Knit Nights. And uh, these are knit nights that are organised by Amy Gilles of La Bien Aimé. And they're, I haven't actually attended one of the knit nights themselves. I think you can. <laughs> I've just been watching them on YouTube. They, they record them and share them on YouTube. So I watched one just recently, which was um, featured Nora Gone and Andrea Mowry. And they have them and they have a couple of their test knitters uh, on as well. And they, they, uh, you know, they do interviews and they, they question them and they get them to show some of their, their works in progress and all kinds of things. It's just really lovely. It's very warm. Uh, Amy always has her one of um, her staff on, on or a couple of her staff there as well. Uh, so it's lovely to get to know them a little bit better, too. And it just feels like you're sitting amongst friends and, you know, you're a knit night experience, I suppose, but um, but on YouTube. So I, I recommend that you check those out, too. And yeah, the other thing I've been watching on YouTube <laughs> is um, The Voice uh, Norway and The Voice France. So uh, if you've not discovered them yet, you are in for a treat. <laughs> I also like The Voice Holland as well. Those are, those are my three favourites. Um, so I will share in my show notes a couple of my favourite videos from those shows this season. So you can, you can check those out. And the last thing is that Florence and the Machine has released her latest single and it's called King. And it's called chapter one. So having experienced chapter one, I am now desperate for all the other chapters. <laughs> I think Florence and the Machine must be one of my absolute favourite artists. I think she's a fascinating woman and with the most compelling voice and lyrics. And um, this this new track that she's released is, is absolutely phenomenal. And the video is fascinating too. So um, I will share a link to that in the show notes as well. Oh, oh my goodness, all the things, all the things bringing me joy. But I will bring it to a close actually. And in doing so, I want to share a poem with you that um, I discovered just this morning um, because I decided that what I wanted to share with you was a poem about peace, but I wasn't sure what poem. And this is a, this is a good way to find a poem <laughs> is, is to go straight to Google and to Google something like poems about peace, which is what I did this morning. And I found an article, um, which was, I can't remember where the article was, but it included 10 poems uh, from various different periods in history uh, that were about peace. And they mentioned a poem called Peace on Earth. And it's by William Carlos Williams, who I absolutely love because he has very, um, powerful and clear imagery. So I clicked through in order to read that uh, poem and I think it's perfect. It's a poem that is actually talking about the constellations in the sky and um, the activity of the, of the myths and the narratives that are playing out across the night sky while we are asleep in our beds. Um, so I, I think it's a very powerful one and not least because um, because of the, the present moment and the, the kind of the global conflicts that we are in the midst of and, and moving through. And um, so, yeah, this is, this is a call for peace on earth. The archer is wake, the swan is flying, gold against blue, an arrow is lying. There is hunting in heaven, sleep safe till tomorrow. The bears are abroad, the eagle is screaming, Gold against blue, their eyes are gleaming. Sleep, sleep safe till tomorrow. The sisters lie with their arms intertwining. Gold against blue, their hair is shining. The serpent writhes, Orion is listening. Gold against blue, his sword is glistening. Sleep, there is hunting in heaven. Sleep safe till tomorrow. So, my darlings, I am sending you out into the world after this podcast and wishing you peace on earth and peace in your hearts, peace in your knitting, and I will see you really soon.